Think about um, the last time you saw an animal just effortlessly discard something essential, like a snake leaving its skin behind. Or maybe a cicada shell just stuck to a tree trunk. Exactly. The natural world is, well, it's full of these incredible acts of shedding and renewal. It really is a fundamental process. And today we're going to dive into the world of arthropods, you know, insects, crustaceans, arachnids, and explore their fascinating way of doing this. Molting. Yes, molting. A listener actually reached out curious about the whole thing, the how and the why these creatures shed their exoskeletons. Yeah, that's a great question. So that's our mission for this deep dive, unpacking molting, sometimes called ecstasis or sloughing or just shedding. We want to look at the mechanics, the, uh, the reasons behind it, the challenges, and maybe compare across different arthropod groups. And, you know, to really get why molting is so vital for them, we have to remember their defining feature that rigid external skeleton, the exoskeleton. Right, the suit of armor. Exactly. It gives amazing support, great protection, and it's even where their sensory systems attach. But, and this is the key thing, right? That armor doesn't stretch. It just doesn't grow with them. Precisely. So if an arthropod wants to get bigger, there's really no choice but to, well, ditch the old one and grow a completely new, larger version. Okay, let's really get into the weeds then. What is molting? What's actually happening? Well, at its most basic, molting is when an animal casts off a part of its body. For arthropods, yeah, the most obvious part is the exoskeleton. But you mentioned it's more than just getting bigger. Oh, absolutely. It's also a chance to replace damaged bits. Think about getting a clean, fresh surface on your eye lenses if they're external. That'd be handy. Definitely. And maybe the most dramatic part is that molting drives metamorphosis. You know, that total transformation we see in lots of insects as they grow up. Ah, uh, like the classic caterpillar to butterfly. That's molting, driving a huge change. Okay, let's focus on insects first, our six-legged friend. They've got this amazing exoskeleton, as you said. So what's their molting story? Right, so the exoskeleton gives them structure, protection, sensory input. But its rigidity, like we said, limits growth. To get bigger, they have to shed that outer layer and secrete a new, larger one underneath. Seems simple, but it must have huge implications. Oh, it really does. This single constraint a rigid outer shell has basically driven an incredible amount of evolutionary diversity. Think about complex metamorphosis or how they time reproduction around molting. It all ties back. And I've heard the term instars. What's an instar exactly? An instar is uh, simply the stage in an insect's life between two molts. So it lives and grows within one exoskeleton, that's one instar. Then it molts, enters the next instar, and in it's new, bigger exoskeleton. Got it, like chapters in its growth story. So yeah. how does the insect you know, know its time? Is there an alarm clock going off inside? Huh, not quite an alarm clock, but yeah, it's hormonally controlled, largely. The whole sequence from starting to separate the old skin to actually shedding it is orchestrated by a steroid hormone. It's called ectisone. Ectisone. The molting hormone? That's the one. It's made by glands in the thorax, usually, and its release is actually triggered by another hormone from the brain. So it's like a signal cascade. Brain says go, thorax releases ectosone, and the process kicks off. Time for a new outfit, basically. Okay, hormones give the signal. Then what actually happens? What are the steps in this big shed? Well, we can break it down into roughly three main stages. First is apolysis. A polysis. Yeah, polysis. That's when the old cuticle, the old exoskeleton, starts to detach from the cell layer underneath the epidermis. These epidermal cells then get busy, they divide, and start secreting the layers of a brand new cuticle right underneath the old one. Wow. Already building the new one before the old one's off. Exactly. And get this, during a polysis, enzymes released by these cells actually start digesting the inner layer of the old cuticle, the endocuticle. They leave the hard outer bit, the exocuticle, intact for the moment. So they're recycling materials even as they build. That's smart. Incredibly efficient, isn't it? They're dismantling the old suit while tailoring the new one underneath. It's pretty amazing biological engineering. Okay, so a polysis is the prep work. What's next? Next comes ectasis itself, the actual shedding event. The old cuticle usually splits open, typically along the back of the thorax. Then the insect has to physically wriggle its way out. Sounds like hard work. It really can be. They often increase their internal body pressure, the hemolymph pressure, to help. It's like inflating themselves from the inside. They might swallow air or water, contract muscles, anything to help pop out of the old shell. And then they emerge. But they're exposed, right? We out their armor. Exactly. That's the really critical moment. The new cuticle is soft. It hasn't hardened. So this is a super vulnerable period. Their protection is basically gone for a bit. Yikes. 
And to make sure the new exoskeleton is big enough before it hardens, some insects will puff themselves up even more, taking in air or water to stretch it out. Then comes the final stage, sclerotization. Sclerotization. That sounds like hardening. That's exactly what it is. The new cuticle hardens and darkens, usually over a few hours. This is also when, for winged insects, the wings get expanded to full size. Again, they use hemolymph pressure to inflate the wing veins like tiny balloons. So, fresh out, puff up, then solidify. It really is like a superhero changing, but way squishier at first. Hmm. I also read some insects eat their old skin. It seems kind of gross. Yeah. Maybe a bit gross to us, but it's actually very practical. That shed skin, the exuvia, it contains valuable nutrients, ketin, minerals, stuff the insect can reuse. Why waste it? Reduce, reuse, recycle. Insect style. Good point. Mm. But are there any risks to eating it? Like old parasites or something? That's a really interesting question and something scientists probably do consider. There's always a trade-off in nature. Okay, so insects mul multiple times. But the number varies a lot, doesn't it? Some just a few, some dozens. Yeah, what causes that difference? It often comes down to determinate versus indeterminate growth. Determinate means they have a set genetically fixed number of molts. They reach adulthood, maybe molt one last time, and that's it. They stop growing. As adults, yes, often. Others show indeterminate growth, meaning they might keep molting throughout their adult life, though that's a bit less common in insects. Interesting. Why stop? Maybe it ties into reproduction or lifespan. Very likely. Different life strategies. And this all connects to those different life cycles you hear about, right? The ametabolus. How am I metabolus? Oh, the metabolus. Yeah. How does molting fit into those? Right. Those terms just describe how much metamorphosis happens, and molting is the engine for all of them. Ametabolus insects, like silverfish, basically no metamorphosis. The young look like mini adults. They just molt to get bigger, same outfit, bigger size. Simple size upgrade. Okay. Then hemimetabolus incomplete metamorphosis. Think dragonflies or grasshoppers. The young, the nymphs, they kind of resemble the adults but lack wings and uh, mature reproductive parts. With each molt, they get a bit bigger and wing buds might develop gradually. The final molt brings them to the winged adult stage. So a step-by-step -step transformation over several molts. Exactly. And finally, holometabolist complete metamorphosis. Your butterflies, beetles, flies, they have a larval stage caterpillar, grub, maggot, totally different from the adult. They molt several times as larvae, growing bigger each time. Then they enter a pupil stage. The chrysalis or cocoon phase. Right, a non-feeding transformative stage. The final molt is from the pupa to the radically different adult form. That's the full makeover. From a wormy thing to winged wonder, basically. Wow. And the number of molts can range from, what, three or four times? To 50 or even more in some cases, especially with long larval stages or that indeterminate growth. It really shows the incredible variety of insect life strategies. Okay, that gives us a great picture for insects. Yeah. With ectosone running the show. What about crustaceans? Crabs, lobsters, shrimp. Is it a similar deal for them? Yes, very similar in the fundamental need. Crustaceans also undergo molting, usually called ectosis, in crustacean circles to grow. That rigid exoskeleton leaves them no other choice. Same problem, same basic solution. Is the hormonal control similar too? Do they have their own ectosome? They do, or rather a very similar family of hormones called ictostroids, ict steroid hormones, just like in insects. And interestingly, it looks like crustaceans actually have the same basic set of enzymes to make these ictostroids as insects do. The same toolkit, essentially. Pretty much. Evolution seems to have used similar building blocks, but maybe tweaks the regulation, the control mechanisms in these different groups, yeah. you know, different pressures shaping how they develop. So same recipe, maybe different chefs or different timing. Where do crustaceans make these hormones? Insects use thoracic glands. In crustaceans, a key place is the Y organ, usually found up in the head region, and scientists have found these specific genes involved in making the ectosteroids there. They have these uh, slightly fun names, uh -oh. sometimes called the halamine genes. Names like phantom, disembodied, shadow, and shade. Halloween genes. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yeah, a bit of scientific humor, I guess. But these genes code for enzymes, specifically P450 monoxygenases, that are crucial for building the active hormone. They add specific chemical groups, hydroxyl groups, in a precise sequence to the steroid molecule. The proposed order is like a step-by-step -step modification at different carbon atoms. C25, then C22, then C2, then C20. Phantom. Disembodied. I love it.
Science needs more spooky gene names. So these genes build the go molt signal. Is there a stop molting signal too? Yes, absolutely. Crustaceans have something called molt inhibiting hormone or MIH. It's often produced in glands in their eye stalks. In the eye stalks, huh? Yep. And MIH basically puts the brakes on molting. It suppresses the process, seemingly by inhibiting the expression of genes like phantom back in the Y organ. So it stops the production line for the molting hormone. Okay, so MIH says, hold on, not yet. Exactly. And what's interesting is that while we know what it does inhibits molting at the gene level, the precise way it sends that stop signal inside the cell is still something researchers are working out. Fascinating. And that's different from insects, right? You said their brain hormone promotes molting. That's a key difference, yeah. In insects, the brain hormone, PTTH, stimulates the glands to make ectosones, a positive signal. In crustaceans, MIH is a negative signal, an inhibitor. So similar end hormones, but different upstream controls. It highlights how evolution can tinker. Checks and balances, but coming from different directions. Okay, what about these spiders and their kin, the arachnids? Do they molt too? They absolutely do. Spiders, scorpions, mites, they all have exoskeletons and need to shed them to grow. The process is fundamentally similar. Anything unique about spider molting? Well, research highlights that nutrition is really important for spiders. They need to be well-fed and in good condition to molt successfully. It seems quite demanding for them. Makes sense. You probably need a lot of resources to build a whole new body covering. Exactly. And it makes you wonder, you know, what specific cues trigger their molt? Maybe temperature, humidity, day length. And how does their behavior after molting compare to, say, a crab? Lots still to learn there. So being well-fed helps ensure a smooth shed. Which leads us to maybe the most dramatic aspect, the danger. Molting sounds risky. Oh, extremely risky. It's probably the most vulnerable time in an arthropod's life. Remember that new exoskeleton is soft, offers almost no protection initially. And they can't move well either, right? while they're shedding. Often, yes, they're temporarily immobile or very sluggish during the actual exodysis. This makes them sitting ducks for predators. You just picture it. Stuck halfway yeah. out, can't run, can't fight back. It's a huge risk. There was that recent story on Reddit about a pet millipede called Quibber. Quibber the millipede? What happened? Well, the owner apparently didn't realize Quibber was molting underground and accidentally disturbed him, dug him up. And because of that disturbance, the molt got stuck. It just highlights how critical it is for them to be undisturbed. Oh, poor Quibber. That's awful. So even just being touched can mess it up. It absolutely can. It can damage the delicate new cuticle or prevent them from getting out of the old one properly. That's why many, like millipedes, try to find sheltered spots, often burrowing underground, to molt in peace. It really emphasizes the trade-off. They have to molt to grow and survive long-term, mm. but the act itself puts them in mortal danger. Precisely. The softness, the immobility, it increases risk from predators, from environmental stress, like drying out, everything. Given how dangerous it is, have any arthropods evolved ways to speed it up or maybe molt together for safety? That's a great evolutionary question. Faster hardening, synchronized molting in some species. These are potential strategies driven by that intense selective pressure during molting. The benefits of growth must just outweigh these huge risks, especially in certain environments. Okay, so looking across the groups, insects, crustaceans, arachnids, we've seen similarities like the exoskeleton shedding and hormones, but also differences like MIH versus PDTH. Any other really unique molting stories out there? One really cool one is in mayflies. They're unique among insects because they have a winged stage called the subamago that actually molts again into the final winged adult stage. Wait, they molt after they already have wings. Yep, <laughs> a winged insect molting into another winged form. It's the only group known to do that, like getting two sets of wings almost. That is unique. Mm -hmm. Anything else stand out, maybe linking molting to other life events? Yeah, definitely. In some crustaceans, like a type of paddle crab, Ovalipes catharis, the female must molt right before mating can happen. The male often guards her while she's soft. So molting is a prerequisite for mating in that case. Exactly. It shows how deeply integrated molting is, not just for growth, but for reproduction and other critical parts of their life cycle. It's not just about getting bigger. It dictates other major life events. It really makes you look at that shed cicada shell or crab carapace differently, doesn't it? It's right. not just discarded waste. It's a sign of this intense, risky, but essential process of renewal. Absolutely. A testament to their cycle of life. So as we wrap up this deep dive, what's a final thought, something for you, our listeners, to maybe uh, chew on? Well, thinking about just how incredibly vulnerable they are during molting, soft, exposed, often stuck in one place, 
How do you think the sheer diversity of arthropods reflects different solutions? What specific behaviors or strategies might different groups have evolved to boost their survival odds during this critical time? That's a great question. And maybe beyond the obvious risks like predators, what other less obvious challenges might come from having to completely shed and regrow your entire body covering periodically? Hmm. Lots to think about there. If this deep dive into molting has sparked your curiosity, definitely dig deeper. Look into specific groups, maybe the spiders or the crustaceans with their Halloween genes, or get lost in the world of hormonal control. There's a whole universe hidden inside those exoskeletons.